morning. Uh, <clears throat> this morning, I would like to speak, as we did last week, on the subject of prophecy. But I'd like us to keep our eye on the most important thing when it comes to the, sec the prophetic scriptures. And that is the second coming of Christ. There are a couple of verses I want to read this morning to begin with in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, Paul says, uh, For they themselves were concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What were the Thessalonians doing? They had turned to God to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son. They were waiting for the Lord Jesus. Paul then goes in chapter 4 and verses 13 to 18 and he says this. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. These verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are especially meaningful to me. These are the first verses. This is the first passage I ever preached on in my life. I was a high school student and I had just been saved probably six months earlier. Uh, just before my senior year in high school. I grew up in a Methodist church and a Presbyterian church, a number of different uh, churches like that. I had never heard about the second coming of Christ. When I, when I discovered this truth about the Lord's coming, it was something that, that really excited me. And so when I had a chance to speak to a, a very large Sunday school class of high school students, I turned to this passage and spoke about the second coming of Christ. Now I'd have to say, if you look back to those days, there was a different atmosphere and a, a different sense of excitement about the second coming of Christ from what I see in the church today, you could hardly come to a meeting on a Sunday morning without somebody, somebody mentioning the second coming of Christ. There was one assembly that I went to uh, during the summertime in uh, a suburb of Philadelphia. And uh, there was a man who, who every, every Sunday morning would get up and he'd say, you know, the Lord's going to come. And it may be today. It may be today. He was convinced that he was, uh, he was going to see the Lord's coming before the end of his, of his life. The early church, the early church had this kind of expectant attitude. Uh, I don't think that we have it today. When was the last time you heard a sermon on the second coming of Christ. 
I used to ask my students, how many of you were saved through a message on the second coming of Christ? And I used to get many hands in class that would be raised saying that it was through a message on the Lord's coming that they came to know the Lord. If I ask that question today, there is almost no one who will raise their hands. We do not think about the second coming of Christ. And what I am speaking on today is not going to be anything new. I am not going to speak on anything that uh, is, uh, is basically uh, a doctrinal controversy. I am going to speak about the fact that we need to have the attitude of the early church and love the coming of the Lord Jesus so that it affects our lives and we live in the light of that coming. When you look at the, at the New Testament, not only you, do, do you have these verses like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10 where they, they turn to the Lord to serve the Lord and to wait for His Son. But also in Titus chapter 2 in verse 13, Paul says that the, that the second coming, he says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. It was their blessed hope. It filled them with excitement. It filled them with joy and they were looking for the coming of Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were waiting for Him. They were looking for Him. There's a verse I want you to look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And there's just one word here. That is, that is very interesting. And that's in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22. And I discover that the New King James translation that I'm reading from right now doesn't have the word that I want. <laughs> but here's what it says. If anyone does not lo love the Lord Jesus, let him be accursed. Now, what we have here in the rest of the verse is Paul switching from Greek to Aramaic. And what he says there and, uh, is Maranatha. Maranatha. Now the New King James translates that. And uh, what it says is, uh, O Lord, come. And that's a good translation of the Aramaic. But the fact that Paul, writing to a Greek church, would use the word Maranatha. The word Mar in, uh, in Aramaic is the word for Lord. And the word uh, Maranatha Na is our Lord. And the word, th part of the word tha means to come. And so, what you had is uh, in, in the early church, the Christians, starting in Jerusalem, were so excited about the coming of the Lord that when they, when they greeted one another, when they left one another, they would depart by saying, Maranatha, Maranatha. You ever say hallelujah? Well, we're too, we're too Presbyterian <laughs> to get that excited <laughs> and to just shout out hallelujah. But that's what the early church did. They would say hallelujah. And then they would think about the coming of Christ and they would say, Maranatha, Maranatha, Lord, come. 
It's the attitude that you have at the end of Revelation 22 where it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. And John replies by saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Now, the New Testament Christians were excited about and looking for the coming of Christ. And what I want to do today is suggest to you at least six reasons why we should be looking for and waiting for and living in the light of the coming of Christ. Why should we be looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus? Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And in verse 2, the Lord, and remember, this is the night this is the night when he is speaking to his disciples in the upper room. And he says to them, the night before his crucifixion, In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, you notice what the Lord is saying here? Why should we be waiting for his coming? He says here, he tells us that he is going to come again. The words that the Lord spoke to his disciples this night were, uh, were words that really troubled them. He told them that he was going to leave them. He told them that he was departing. He told them that they could not go with him. But he says, I will come again. I will come again. You see why the disciples were waiting for the Lord? He, he told them that he was coming. They wanted to be with him. They wanted to be with him. And those, the, the fact of being separated from him was something that discouraged him. And so during the time of that separation, there was nothing that encouraged them more and gave them greater hope was the promise, I will come again. Do you remember? I'm not speaking about remembering by the remembering of hearing them, but remembering having heard of the words of Douglas MacArthur when the Japanese were invading the Philippines and MacArthur was forced to leave. He told the Filipino people, I shall return. I shall return. And during those years of occupation, the, 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 the time when the, the Japanese were controlling that country, what gave hope for the Filipino people were the words of MacArthur, I shall return. They were waiting for that day. And uh, when they were persecuted, when the times were difficult, that promise and that hope sustained them. We should be looking for and waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus because he told us, he told us that he was going to come again. Now, there's a second reason that we should be looking for the coming of Christ. And it also comes from these verses here in John chapter 14. When the Lord spoke to them, he said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
Why should we be looking for the coming of Christ? We should be looking for his coming because we, we love him and we want to be with him. Shouldn't we? Do you want to be with the Lord Jesus? If you love him, you really do want to be with him. Have you ever been separated from someone that you, that you really love? I am always amused at this time of year. We have, uh, we have just begun our, our, our spring break at Emmaus. And it's interesting to see some of these young couples who are in love <laughs> who are going to be separated from each other for a week. <laughs> you would think that this was going to be for a lifetime. <laughs> the, the parting is, uh, is, so, is so sad. How am I going to be make, make it to be separated from you for this long period of time? The fact is, the fact is that if you really do sub love a person, to be separated from them hurts. When I was uh, in, in seminary in, uh, in the middle 60s, there was a student, one of my fellow students, who was from North Korea. Back in uh, somewhere around 1950, he was a newly married young pastor of a church in North Korea. And he got a very sudden word that the police were coming for him that he was going to be arrested and that he was going to be executed. And so he had to flee for his life. Uh, he had to flee immediately. And he had to leave North Korea by himself. He left that young wife of his back in North Korea. This was 15 years later that I knew this student. For 15 years, he had been trying to get his wife out of North Korea so that she could, she could join him here in the United States. For 15 years, there was not a day that went by that he was not thinking of her. He loved her. He wanted to be with her. And so he was looking forward to that day when they would be reunited. It was, uh, it was uh, sort of a, uh, a storybook kind of, uh, of, of incident that while we were there in seminary, he was able to get her released from North Korea uh, and they were reunited there in, in Dallas. It was an exciting time. It was an exciting time. But that's what we should be looking forward to if we love the Lord Jesus. He told us that he was going to come again and take us to be with himself. What are you looking forward to? Are you looking for some mansions in glory? <laughs> are you looking for the, the streets of gold? Are you looking forward to the beauties of heaven? Or are you looking forward to the prospect of being with the Lord Jesus, of seeing him face to face and then spending eternity in his presence. If you really love him, then the fact of being with him is really the only thing that is of ultimate significance. We should be looking for the Lord Jesus and his coming because we want to be with him and spend eternity with him. Now, there's a third reason why we should be waiting for the coming of Christ. We should be looking for his coming because we do not know when he will come. We do not know when he was, will come. When our Lord was talking with his disciples in the upper room, and we have this here in Matthew chapter 
in Matthew chapter 24. He said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he says in verse 42, Watch there, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. What he says is, you do not know when I am going to come. No one knows. And in Mark's gospel, he says, not even the Son. The angels don't know. Not even the Son. No one knows. Therefore, watch. Be watching. I think our Lord has deliberately kept us in ignorance as to when he is going to come in order that we might live in this kind of watchful way. If the Lord had said, I am going to come a thousand years from now, then through the first 900 years of the church, no one would have been, no one would have been looking for the coming of Christ. They would have lived their lives with no practical expectation or results from this doctrine of his coming. But our Lord has said, no one knows, therefore be watchful. And that is the word to every generation of Christians from the first century until, until now. One of the things that has plagued the church through the centuries is Christians that have tried to tell us when the Lord is going to come. There have been always those who have been date setters, those who have been making predictions of when Christ is going to come. I went this week and just Googled uh, this kind of thing of date setters. And I got uh, several pages <laughs> of different dates that have been set in the history of the church, of people that have been saying, this is when the Lord is going to come. Usually, they look for numbers in scriptures and will read some kind of mystical significance into these numbers. You know, in Revelation 11, it talks about the... Uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the two witnesses that will witness for 1260 days. And then in chapter 12, uh, that's in chapter 11, in chapter 12 it talks about the, the woman who is persecuted for 1260 days. Well, around 1200, there were those who looked at that number and said, that means 1260 days? Those really mean years. And so the Lord is going to come in, the, in 1260 A.D. Uh, in uh, the time of the Reformation, or after the Reformation, the, the numbers got a little bit more complicated. But Daniel speaks about uh, 1290 days. And then he mentions... 1,335 days. This is at the end of the book of Daniel. Somebody added up those two numbers. Added to that what was the supposed date for the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Took away the thousand years of the millennium. And they said, the Lord's going to come in 1694. And uh, they had it all figured out. Back in 1844, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist, William Miller, was saying that in October 22nd of 1844, the Lord was going to come. And he stirred up the country with uh, that kind of expectation. Many people quit their jobs. They, they, they went out and were waiting for the Lord's coming on that day. Some of you, some of you remember uh, things that have happened in your lifetime where there have been predictions for the coming of Christ. Some of them have been not just from the fringes and the kooks. In fact, back in 1967, you remember the, the Six-Day War 
with Israel. One of my professors at Dallas Seminary made a prediction that related to the coming of Christ. His verse was in uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 24 that says, it speaks about the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And when you think about it, that verse is saying that after A.D. 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, go through the centuries, Jerusalem was under, was under Gentile control until 1967. Uh, in 1967, in the Six-Day War, for the first time, really, since A.D. 70, the Jewish people were in control of the whole city of Jerusalem. So one of my professors got up in chapel and he says, uh, he says uh, this prophecy has been fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles has come to an end. Now, he may or may not be right on that. And just saying that was not anything to get him in trouble. But then his next statement was, gentlemen, I do not believe that we will begin another year of classes at Dallas Seminary. <laughs> when we were down in Dallas, Nancy was the secretary for the president of Dallas Seminary, John Walvard. And John Walvard really was, uh, his specialty was the area of prophecy. And he was the president of the school. And so he chose the chapel speakers. And I think it was within a twinkle in his eye that the next year, the fall uh, of that year, uh, for the first week of chapel, he chose this, this professor <laughs> to be one of the chapel speakers. And I think the whole faculty came to him and reminded him of his prediction <laughs> from the previous year and pointed out to him that he was a false prophet, <laughs> that he did not really have the gift of, of prophecy. Now, that was 45 years ago that he made that that he made that statement and that prediction. And the Lord still hasn't come because no one knows the day or the hour. Some of you remember back in 1988, there was a booklet that appeared, 88 reasons why Christ's return will be in 1988. There was a writer by the name of Edgar Wiesenant and that book, that book was, was circulating around the assembly camps all over the country. And it was stirring up quite a, a, a reaction in a lot of Christians uh, in, in those camps. That September, I even got a, a, uh, a special delivery overnight package somebody sending me this one of my former students sending me this 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 booklet and say can you can can you give me an answer I, I, I can't refute what he is saying I wanted to say in response would you just wait two weeks and you'll have your answer because he was saying that it was going to that it was going to be at uh, I think in September 11th, 12th, or 13th of 1988. But the Lord didn't return. It's interesting, by the way, that that person who wrote the booklet, he, he, he flew over to Jerusalem in order to, uh, in order to be there on the Mount of Olives when the Lord returned. Somebody, a reporter, caught him in the Denver airport and asked him, now tell me, 
Did you buy a one-way or a round-trip ticket? <laughs> and he was caught because he had bought a round-trip ticket. <laughs> some of you, some of you remember last May when Harold Camping, who had founded that family radio, has radio stations all over the country, was saying that uh, the Lord was going to come on May 21st. And uh, we were down in, in Argentina at the time, and, and the people down there were talking about this prediction that the Lord was going to come on May 21st. And uh, then when he didn't come on May 21st, Camping said, oh, uh, it was, it, it's, it's really October 21st. And finally, when the Lord didn't come on October 21st, he says, well, I must have made a mistake. This is the third time he's made a prediction as to when the Lord was going to come. He said it was going to be in 1988. He said it was going to be in 1994. He said it was going to be in uh, 2011. Uh, How he did not lose credibility long ago, I do not know. But nobody should have believed him in the first place. Because the Lord said, no one knows the day or the hour. We are not intended to know the time of the coming of Christ. Because we are meant, the Lord meant for us to live in the daily expectation. It could be today. He said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, when they were asking, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it now? And the Lord said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. It's not for you to know the when. What you are to do is live faithfully for me in the meantime and live in the light of his coming and be faithful until that day comes. You know why people are continually setting dates for the coming of Christ? Because his promise, his promise doesn't seem to be enough. His promise that he is going to come does not excite us enough. And so if I can come up with a date and I can say it's going to be two months from now or six months from now or in this coming year, then that seems real enough that I can get excited about it. But we should be looking for the coming of Christ because he told us we would come, he would come, and we do not know when. Let me give you a fourth reason why we should be looking for the coming of Christ. It comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 to 53. We should be looking for the coming of Christ because we are not yet all that we were meant to be. We are not yet all that we were meant to be. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. God is not finished with us yet. I remember listening uh, many times to J. Vernon McGee, one of the old-time preachers, very colorful preachers, but he would, uh, he would often point to himself and he would say, look at me, this is not the best that the grace of God can do. <laughs> this is not the best 
that the great grace of God can do. There are two things that are going to pl plague us until the second coming of Christ. One of them is death. It is not until Christ comes again that this mortal will put on immortality. Death will be swallowed up in victory. It is not until the second coming of Christ. And the second thing that will plague us until the second coming of Christ is sin. Is sin. Sin in our own personal lives. Do you struggle with sin? Do you struggle with sin? We should. We should. If we don't struggle with sin, it means that, we're be that, that we've become insensitive to it. I remember uh, uh, a dear old friend who's now with the Lord, Paul Sapp. And he used to pray. He used to pray, Lord, help me to hate my sin. If we hate our sin, then we will be waiting for the coming of Christ. Because that struggle with sin is going to continue until Christ returns. John says in 1 John chapter 3 that uh, when he appears, when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. We will be like Christ. Our sin nature will be, will be done away with. We will no longer sin. We will be living uh, without sin. And that should be the longing of every godly heart. We should be waiting for the Lord's return because we are not yet all that we are meant to be. But we will when he comes and changes us and we become like him. A fifth reason why we should be waiting for the coming of Christ. We wait for him because there is a need for justice here in the world. Verse that I'm thinking of is in Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. Here we read of the, of the cries of the, of the souls, the martyrs that have been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they maintained. And it says in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? How long until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now that's a cry of, of it's a cry of frustration. Uh, we live in a world that is, is, is evil and corrupt. There's something wrong in this world. It is obvious. Uh, good, good men and women suffer, are exploited, they are trampled down. And those who are evil often prosper. This is a fact of the world in which we are living in. When we lived in the Chicago area, I used to listen to a uh, radio program that was often on uh, WBBM on, on Sunday night, old time radio. And one of the one of the programs that you, uh, that that I liked was the Shadow, uh, and it would always end with these words: "The weeds of crime bear f bitter fruit. Uh, crime does not pay." The Shadow knows. Well, if you're on a fictitious listening to a fictitious radio program, good always does triumph <laughs> and evil always is put down. But that's not the world we live in. Crime does pay and it pays big. If you go down to the border of the United States in Mexico, if you go down to Juarez, 
It's chaos down there. Why? Because the drug industry is so successful. They have so many billions of dollars. They have, they have the money to buy better weapons, to train better soldiers, to have a better trained and equipped army than the Mexican government. Crime pays. That's the world that we are living in. Evil does triumph. And what you see here in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, those martyrs sense the problem. They cry out, how long? Lord, where is justice? How long is it going to be until wrong is made right? Will it happen? Yes, the Bible says it will happen. It will happen. Wrong will be made right. There will be justice here on this earth. It will happen when the Lord Jesus comes again. Paul says in, in uh, 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will come and he will deal justly with those who have, been, who, who have, who have done wrong and he will vindicate those such as these martyrs who are here seen in Revelation chapter 6. We wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus because we desire to see justice established here in this world. Let me give you one final reason that we should be waiting for the coming and looking for the coming of Christ. We we should be waiting for him because we desire to see Christ honored and give his, given his rightful due. I remember a while back that I was, was channel surfing and I came across a, a station where you had a, a comedian who was, uh, who was mocking, mocking the Lord and mocking the Savior. I listened to that for maybe 90 seconds. I couldn't stand it. I had to, I had to turn it off. I had to switch, switch channels. How do you feel when, uh, when your wife or your mother or your husband is mocked and ridiculed? Does that bother you? It does. Uh, that's one of the things that makes the most mild of us <laughs> furious. Well, we live in a world when the Lord Jesus is mocked and ridiculed. There are many people who only mention the name of the Lord Jesus in, in profanity. He is despised and rejected of men. Uh, he is scorned and reproached. That will last until the second coming of Christ. Psalm 2 speaks of this kind of thing. It says in Psalm 2 that the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They set themselves against God's anointed Messiah. It says in verse 4 that uh, the Lord tells his attitude toward this insult and slander. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion my holy mountain. Those words are a warning. They are a warning from God. 
they, it, it says, God will honor his son and everyone who rejects the son and despises him will suffer for him, for that. The psalm ends, it goes on to say uh, in verses 10 to 12, Now there, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you. It is a warning to submit to the Lord Jesus. Do homage to him. This is the day in which men and women have the opportunity to turn to the Lord Jesus, receive Him as favor, as Savior, kiss the Son, be reconciled to God. But if you do not, there will be a day of judgment. There will be a day in which He will be angry. The Bible says in Philippians 2 that a day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That doesn't mean that everybody is going to be saved. That ever, it doesn't mean that everybody is going to do that willingly. But God is going to establish His Son in His glory upon His throne and He will rule in power and, uh, and, and justice and righteousness over the whole world world. If we love the Lord Jesus, we should be looking forward to that day. We should look forward to the day when he will be displayed in his glory and no one, no one will be cursing him. No one will be speaking against him. No one will be openly rebelling against him anymore. But all, whether willingly or unwillingly will acknowledge him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and will bow at his feet and will submit to him. If you love the Lord Jesus, you will desire for that day to come when you will see him and his, in, his, in his glory. What is your attitude? What is your attitude towards the coming of Christ. Can you sing? Coming again, coming up. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, maybe soon, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day that will be. Jesus is coming again. We are looking for his coming because he told us he's going to come. We should be looking for his coming because we want to be with him. We want to be with him. We should be looking for his coming because we don't know when he is going to come. And he told us to watch. We should be looking for his coming because we are not yet all that we are meant to be. We should be looking for his coming because we desire to see justice and right prevail here in this world. And we should be looking for his coming because we want to see him in his glory, in his glory, in his rightful place acknowledged by all. The Lord Jesus says at the end of the New Testament, yes, I am coming quickly. And John's response was, <laughs> even so. Even so, amen. Come, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, Maranatha. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Savior, the one who is coming for us to take us to be with himself. May this be our hope. May it be a living hope. We pray that this hope would not become dim in our own, in our own hearts, but that we would be looking for 